So as, it, as Joe said, this morning started off quite differently. Um, <laughs> in the Bible college, when we'd have um, different things that would occur, it would, you know, we had drills. So if there was an active shooter, so we had active shooter drills. We talked about it in faculty meetings and all of those things for um, bomb threats. You had certain protocols that you had to follow. So this morning kind of brought all that back into focus. And so poor Teresa comes up the stairs and, and I, she can just hear the tail end of my conversation with Joe because I'm telling him we have to call the state police and then I've got to get to the church because I can't have anybody go into the church if we have an active bomb threat. Um, for obvious reasons, because all it takes is one musician coming in and going in and trying to get something set up and they accidentally set something off. And then, so that's what this morning looked like. So apparently my eggs are still sitting on the counter at home, which brings up a separate thought. I'm pretty sure the dog's going to get into those eggs before I do. <laughs> is a total separate thing. But it also made me think because, you know, when you're standing outside the church at 7.15 in the morning, you realize there's many things that you haven't thought about at 7.15. Um, what a different time and age it is that we can have somebody somewhere sending these things out and we now live in a society that we have to stop and we actually, you know, because I did the quick analysis and went, what are the chances that this is real? What are the chances that somebody has actually done what they've said that they've done, which is the threat was we've put bombs, multiple, in the building. And it makes you think and you go, well, we're a small church in Cambridge. What are the chances? But then we've had everything going on at the border where there's been people from everywhere in the country coming into the country unsupervised. And then I was, Robin, you almost got a phone call. Because, yeah, <laughs> I, well, I was, because I immediately went to the next step was, well, if there are bombs, then we have to get people on both sides of the church to, out of their homes. And on the humorous side, I thought, well, if I park my van up front, I'll get a new van. <laughs> so, but you can tell, because my van's across the street, because I went, well, that wouldn't work if they had to get emergency vehicles in. But it just made me really think about, like the disciples didn't go through that. That wasn't something that they faced, you know. They might face a Roman soldier or they might face somebody with a knife or a sword, but they didn't have bombs. Um, when the state trooper told us that it was, that it's been making the cycle going through various areas. So last week was New Hampshire's turn and we've seen it with schools. Um, it really brings to focus for us how important it is that we're really seeking the Lord that it really is about him and his kingdom. Because <laughs> I, I learned a few things as I, as I did my walk around the church because I wanted to see. So I got here and I wanted to see, does it look like anybody came and tried to get in on any of the doors? And so when the state trooper arrived, he said, well, the first thing we'll do is we'll take a walk around the outside. And I went, yeah, hit that one. <laughs> But then I also discovered as he was searching, because he checked a lot of the same things I did, except we have a freezer over on the side. And you see, I went, they said bombs on the inside. So I'm taking it that if somebody does put something in the church, that they're going to be honest about where they put it. And he checked the freezer. I didn't. And I went, yeah, because I'm not thinking that way. I will tell you when we searched the inside of this building that there was a f crystal ball fruit punch glass thing and what the 
the protocol is when you're searching, you're looking for anything that's out of the ordinary. So something that doesn't belong, like something that does, doesn't look right. So that's what, so I check the stove. I open the stove. I'm thinking if there's anything in the stove, it'd be like a pot. So when I saw a crystal glass bowl, I immediately closed it. <laughs> and, and I moved so quick that the officer turned around and he went, what was that? And I went, I think it was a crystal bowl. <laughs> and so he started to laugh because, you know, we both react to something. But it just shows how quickly we're conditioned. How quickly life changes to condition us. Um, the things that seem ordinary to me. I didn't check the sump pump, but the officer did. Because I spent so much time in the basement, it's a sump pump. I know what it is, I know what it looks like, but it's those things. And it really brought to light for me, even in our faith, how much we need to be careful when things have become so ordinary. We get so used to things that we don't necessarily see it the way other people see it. And that's where the outside perspective of the state trooper really helped. And I felt a lot better as we searched the building and we were assured that, you know, yes, it's still all of our stuff. It's not anybody else's. Nobody else has come and put other things in. But it also crystallizes for me the world we're living in. Because kids are going through this at school. Schools are getting threats all the time. We need to pray for our communities. We've prayed for the individual that is sending out these emails, and I'm sure it's a little kid somewhere with a, you know, just a little digital device who's having a blast thinking about all the panic and chaos. But the problem is any time that can go from being a prank to being real. And we can't ever treat it as a prank. We have to treat each instance as, oh, it's real, even though it's so different to what we're used to. So it's a new, it's a new day for us. So with all of that, oh, sorry, I've been reflecting for the last few hours as we've gone through this. <laughs> Those are my moments of reflection just to share with everyone. Um, now. As you know, we've had a flood. We have an opportunity that's been presented to us this week. So, we're not gonna take an offering this week for the flood. What I'd like to do is present it to you as a challenge. We have a donor that stepped forward that says they will give $1,000 if the church people will match $1,000. So, that 1,000 will turn into 2,000 if we can raise, so, but they'll do it, they'll, so if, it's, if we can raise 500, then they'll give 500. If we can raise 1,000, then it'll be matched at 1,000. So next week, I'd like to take an, an offering for the flood, for flood funds. Sorry, I don't know why I had trouble with that word. But if we can do that next week. I don't like to do it right away, because I'd like us to be able to think about it and kind of figure out what you feel like you can give um, because we still do have all of these wonderful expenses that come from flood cleanup and flood stuff. So, um, does I have any other announcements? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, apparently I'm still discombobulated. It's, this whole morning's been thrown off. Um, Let's just pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the funds that you've provided for the church. Lord, I thank you for your generosity to the church, for the way you've provided funds for flood relief and just for the way you continue to take care of your church. Lord, we thank you for the state trooper that came today. We thank you for their service. We ask you to bless them. Keep our first responders safe, Lord. Be with them as they step into situations that could turn potentially dangerous. Lord, we just ask you to, especially today, to wrap your arms of protection round about them. We thank you for what you're doing here in our church and for the way that your hand is upon this place. 
We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Joe, would you mind? Thank you. Where did Karina go? Karina, still set? Still good? Okay. Go ahead, guys. You can go with Karina. Yep, go for it. See, just totally out of the ordinary. Sometimes it's best. See, Jim, you should have been here this morning. As I was sure the state trooper was going to go, I've come to the red shoe cult place. As there had to be three of us out there, all with red shoes on, and I'm just going, it seemed like such a humorous thing a few weeks ago, but when the public sees it now, <laughs> it can throw you right off. This week we'll be in Luke 6. Um, we're taking a look at the silent disciples. These are three disciples who we know very little about. And yet the Lord still called them and still lists them within the scriptures. So in Luke chapter 6, verse 15 and part of 16... Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. These are the silent disciples. Um, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who, we call, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, son of James, as opposed to Judas Iscariot. These are the silent disciples because we know very little about them. There's very little recorded in scripture about them and yet the Lord felt that they were important enough to be listed within the list of disciples. We're familiar with silent films. In fact, I think the first Academy Award went to a silent film way back when. In 2012 there was another silent film that came out that won five Academy Awards. So the whole idea of silent we're fairly familiar with. Um, we have the phrase in our language, silence is golden. It's something that we tend to appreciate. Um, it's been said that people prefer preachers when they're silent. Um, you know, as just one of those things. We want our children to be quiet at times where you're begging just for a moment's peace. Uh, I know having a puppy that there now come times when I really wish she didn't have the voice that she has, especially because if Teresa leaves before me in the morning, our dog apparently has some sort of weird anxiety disorder. I don't know this officially, but I know that if Teresa leaves and I'm upstairs, the dog will race over to the stairs and start barking until I come down. And she's quite adamant about it. And even though she's only 30 pounds, she will make all the noise in the world. And, you know, you'd think that the house was on fire until I come downstairs and then she's just thrilled. She's like over the moon. She's flipping around. She's jumping all over, just going, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. Oh, it's so good to see you. She's just seen me half an hour before, but it's all new now because there wasn't anybody there. And so it makes you want silence at times. I've wondered if my neighbors, I fear for them because the dog sits at the stairs and I know for sure the two places share a stairwell. So I can only imagine what it's like for them on their side of the wall. But it makes you appreciate when she's silent. She will come up and she'll, she'll she likes to get up onto my recliner. She kind of thinks that it's her recliner too, especially if I'm in it. And she'll lay down and just kind of lay herself right here. So that her face is like right here. Just so that she you know, can be there. She won't make any noise. She just wants to be there with you. 
And that silence is her just being happy and, you know, content. So you wonder when you come up and you see, we know so much about Matthew, or at least we know a little bit about Matthew. We know so much about Peter. And, you know, the three disciples we're looking at today never had a great speech. They didn't show great leadership. They didn't um, have any major um, disagreements with Jesus. We know very little about them, and yet there are lessons that we can learn from them. And so from James, son of Alphaeus, we learn the lesson of humility. We know nothing about him. He is not quoted. He asks no questions. He had no public flubs. He displayed no great leadership. He demonstrated no significant insight. But could it be that his obscurity finds its place in humility? Because we know with Christ, our focus is not to be on the pedigree and the prominence of men. It's not supposed to be on self-promotion. We tend to be very good at that now. Everybody, how many Twitter followers do you have? How many people are following you on Instagram? Um, and I know there's more. Because my kids are always after me. You should be on social media. <laughs> well, maybe, but... It's not something that I'm really into. I fear having my face on a billboard or that sort of promotion because it's so many things have become about man and not about Christ. And that's where we see with James, son of Alphaeus, it was about the preeminence of Christ in all things. He really understood Colossians 1, 17 and 18, where it says about Jesus, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He might have supremacy. And that's really what it is for us with Christ. It's all about Jesus. And James lays it out very well for us in his example there in Scripture. Everything's about Christ. He's not taking away from the picture that we get of Jesus. The lesson of humility means not I, but Christ. Jesus chose James and used him. James still got the same assignments that the other apostles got. He was still sent out to preach and to heal in Jesus' name. He still did all the same things that the other disciples did, but he did it in such a way that it was all about Jesus and didn't draw attention to himself. He made it all about the Lord and allowed the Lord to be preeminent in everything. And that's what we need to do in our walk with Christ. It's not about us. It's not about building a name for ourselves or a reputation for ourselves. It should be all about Jesus. And that focus is on Jesus. So that everything in our lives is pointing people to Christ and not to ourselves. So when we talk about Andrew Sunday, the... Sorry, Andrew Sunday. Andrew Project, where we're inviting people to come to church. We're inviting people to come to church to meet Jesus. That's what, the, that's what Andrew did. When Andrew invited people, they, he invited them to come and meet Jesus. It wasn't about the church. It wasn't about a particular person. It wasn't about the great programs or the great preaching or any of those other things. It was about, here, let me introduce you to Jesus who has changed everything in my life and he can do the same for you. Because that's what the focus needs to be. Because that's what changes everything. I was listening this morning before the phone call to a program that a guy was doing an interview with somebody else and they were discussing what to do about our culture, what to do about the government, what to do about how messed up society has become. And they were talking about different solutions, but they missed the main focus. And the main focus, the only way we get our country back, the only way that we can turn things around is by turning people to God. They need to turn and they need to find Jesus Christ and that will make all the difference in the world. Because when people find 
find Jesus, everything changes. Everything about their focus, everything about their life. And if it's not about Jesus, then it's not about anything that we need to be bothered with. Because that's really what it comes down to. It's not Republican or Democrat. It's not any of those other things. Those are world systems. When it all comes down to it, what really matters is Jesus Christ. Him crucified, risen from the dead, ascended to heaven. It's all about Jesus. And if it isn't about Jesus, it's not going to change society. Because that's really where it is all about. Is how do we really make an impact? We make an impact by pointing people to Christ. And when people meet Jesus, that's when everything changes. In a small um, Jewish town in Russia, there was a rabbi who disappeared each Friday morning for several hours. He, his devoted disciples boasted that during those hours, their rabbi went to heaven and talked to God. A stranger who moved into town was skeptical, so he decided to check things out. He hid and watched the rabbi. The rabbi got up in the morning, said his prayers, and dressed in peasant clothes. He grabbed an axe, went into the woods, and cut some firewood, which he then hauled to a shack on the outskirts of the village, where an old woman and her sick son lived. The rabbi left them the wood and went home. The newcomer became the rabbi's disciple. Now whenever he hears a villager say, on Friday morning our rabbi ascends to heaven, the newcomer quietly adds, if not higher. And that really needs to be our focus. Our focus needs to be on those random acts of kindness would be how our society would see them now. But those things that are done out of the limelight, those things that meet needs that we know take care of people, because when we do those things, it, that's what makes the difference for people. When you have a lady with a sick son and you help out there, well, we know that the Lord looks after the widows and the fatherless. The scripture tells us that. So we need to be about doing things that aren't limelight things, but that do help take care of people. That's one of the reasons why we have the food shelf that Margaret worked so hard at because that helps to take care of people. It's not a big showy thing. It's not a, a thing where it's celebrated and the news photographers are there all the time saying, look at the great work they're doing. No, it's simply helping to feed and helping to supply things to people that have a need. And we need to be those type of people. It's the quiet things like when you notice it's freshly snowed and the widow her walk hasn't been, hasn't been shoveled. It's slipping out and shoveling that. It's doing those things that are behind the scenes that perhaps other people won't ever see, notice, or acclaim. But the Lord looks down and says, yes, yes, that's when you're taking care of me. That's when you're looking out for me. When I was tired. And you gave me rest. When I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. That's when the Lord, that's when things are most powerful. And that's what draws people to Christ, is when we're doing things and it's not about others seeing it. From Simon, we learn the lesson of priority. Zealots were a factional group of Jews who were strongly opposed to the Roman occupation. They did everything they could to fight against them. According to historians, these were a radical group who came to prominence in the time of the Maccabees. They were rebels, irreconcilable with Rome. History buffs recognize this group as taking place in the historic events surrounding Maseda. Simon demonstrates, though, the lesson of priority. Not zealous for good things, but zealous for the best thing. For Simon, this meant turning zeal and passion towards the one. Don't give all the energy of your life to lesser things. Live for Christ and Christ alone. That's what we see from Simon. It's that idea that Christ is the center of everything. That he is the focus of everything that I do. So it's not what are the good things that I can do today, but rather I live for Christ as a servant, as a slave of Christ. What do I need to do today to honor him? 
to have him be first in my life in everything? What do I have to lay aside of my own? What are the priorities in my life that are getting in the way of Christ? Those are difficult questions because we have a lot of good things. You will have good things in your life, things that you may really like. But if you stop and ask the Lord, Lord, what's holding you back from being priority number one in my life? The Lord may say, that part of your life. It may not even be something that's wrong. It just may be something that's holding you back from more of God. That's becoming so zealous that you say, okay, Lord, you're going to be preeminent in my life. I don't want anything in between you and I. There was a pastor who <clears throat> was wrestling with this. And he got the opportunity to serve, got a call to serve on a Christian board for a great Christian company. Something that went well with his pastorate, something that he'd been passionate about in his life, everything. And so he did what any good pastor would do and he goes and he talks about it with his wife. And his wife says, I don't think you should do it. Our kids are young and they need their father. Well, naturally the pastor... You know, he just took that and went, oh, of course, dear. Because that's the way it goes in these stories. <laughs> Rather, the pastor got a little bit of a chip on his shoulder and went and got quite grumpy about it and spent a few days mulling this over going, well, how could she say that? This would be perfect for my career. This would be perfect for the church. It just has so many good things about it. And so then finally he starts to pray it through with the Lord and the Lord says, you need to make your family your focus. That needs to be number one for you because your kids are young. And so he ends up laying it aside. And he, talking about it a few years down the road, came to the conclusion that that was the very best thing that he could do because he was able to be there with his kids so that the kids had him there so that he wasn't away on weekends and wasn't taken up with calls at night having to deal with the business of this board at that time in his life. And he said it actually came through to be the best thing that could be for his family because that was priority number one. But he had to get to the place where he was able to lay it down. Now, serving on a Christian board is not bad. Serving for a great Christian company is not bad. But sometimes... It's not about bad. Sometimes it's about good or great. Will you lay aside the things... Okay, I got my master's in organizational leadership. Great book by Jim Collins is Good to Great. How do good companies become great companies? And so there's business principles in it. And sometimes in those business principles, it's stopping and looking at things and saying, yes, that's good, but it, those good things can hold me back from becoming great because they're slightly off focus. Sometimes we need to prioritize the things in our lives so that we're not wasting our energy across a bunch of little good things when we need to focus in on the great thing, which is the Lord Jesus. Because I can tell you right now, this society needs us to be the best Christians that we can be. Because they need to know the reason for the hope that's within us. They need to know that there is hope and a life eternal. Because we're going to be gone from here in a blink of an eye. Life goes by so fast. And people need to know that there is life eternal. Jules Verne tells the story of uh, five Civil War veterans who escape from a Civil War prison. And they escape in a balloon. And so they steal this balloon, they get in the balloon, and they escape over the walls. The balloon lifts them up over the walls. And as they're going, they realize they're being pushed out over the ocean. Not quite the direction that they wanted to go, but escape is escape. And when you're escaping from prison, it's an escape. 
but they realize as they're going that this balloon, they have no way of heating the air, so they have no way of keeping it up. The only way they can keep the balloon up is by making sure that it doesn't sink, that weight doesn't pull it down. And so they find themselves to be drifting down towards the water, and so they take their clothes, they take their weapons, and they throw them overboard to lighten the load. And that lightening of the load lifts them up a little bit, but pretty soon they begin to drop again. And so they begin to look around and they take the food and all of the little things that they happen to have there and they throw the food overboard deciding that it's better to be hungry and alive than it is to have the food and be in the water. And so they again rise up just a little bit more. They begin to sink again and they're still out over the ocean water and they're really concerned. They don't have much left to throw and they take a look around and they say, well, this basket that we're riding in is the last thing. We can tie ourselves up in the ropes above and we can float that way. And so they climb up, they get into those ropes and they cut the basket free. And the basket drops into the water and they float up again. As the balloon starts to come down, this time it comes down and, and the land is spotted. And so they determine that they've gotten close enough to the land that they jump out of the balloon and they swim to shore and they find themselves safe on shore having been set free. What they did though was they prioritized and they got rid of everything that was holding them back from life. They figured out what they needed and that all they needed was to get out to life. And so they cut away everything that was holding them back from life. And that's what we need to do in our walk with Christ. We need to cut off those things that are distractions, those things that are holding us back. Anything that's holding us back from making it to that ultimate destination. Because in the end, it doesn't matter if you have food, weapons, clothes, all of those things if you're in the water. It doesn't matter if you have a basket if you're in the water. But if you can get the land, you can live. Which then brings us to Judas, not Iscariot. See, I love that. Um, in some of the versions of scripture it says Judas, not that Judas. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> but, by the way, next week we'll be on that Judas. So, this week we're on not that Judas. For the believer, our response to God is never to be guilt-ridden, but love-driven. When love for God rules in our hearts, then all our impulses turn towards obedience to Him. Love is the root of all true discipleship and the motivation of all true obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So many people struggle to live for Christ, but the issue is not a behavioral one. It's an attitude. It's having the attitude of love. If you love Christ, living for him is the outcome. There is one single reference to Judas outside of the name registry, and it's found in John 14, 22 through 24. And it says, Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. When it all stops and comes down to it, if we love Christ, obedience to him is the outflow in our life. It's, it's what puts our faith walking. It's what shows people what matters to us. I have an illustration there about a strike in a plant and we're, we're hearing a lot about strikes now um, fascinating because I remember in 10th grade social studies that they talked about strikes and we got into a big discussion about strikes and this fascinated me because I was a kid and didn't understand 
economics or any of the world things and I went, why is it that during troubled times, especially economic times, that strikes become such a big issue? Because it doesn't make sense to me. Why would people strike if you need a job? Like if, if you need a job and you need money, you'd figure you'd be working for it. But it seems that during those economic upheavals, strikes become more and more the thing of the culture. And it, it just didn't make sense to me. And now I live in a time when I, op I keep opening up the newspaper, I keep looking at the news feeds going, wow, another company's out on strike, another strike, another strike. So I have an illustration there about a strike. Basically, um, the gentleman has worked for this company for 40 years. As a worker for the company, he has never attended a union meeting, has never been involved in any of that. And in 1992, um, all of a sudden, he ends up taking up a flag and saying, no contract, no peace, no contract, no peace. And this goes on for two years. Uh, just all of a sudden, this, this total change. He ends up sounding the cadence for about 100 workers in that factory. And it all comes down to the fact, the whole reason why he went from being a contented middle-aged manager to becoming one of the leaders of the strike was simply because when they had gone on strike, the company had said, well, we're going to bring in replacement workers. We're just going to replace you. And that's when it hit him. This company doesn't care about me. This company doesn't care a whit about me. They'll replace me in an instant. And that's what led him to that strike position. And that's the same thing we've done with the Lord at times, where we go on strike against God where we've said, where God has said, I love you, I love you unconditionally. He loves us while we're yet sinners, and yet we have chosen to go on strike. We have not accepted what the Lord has done. We haven't accepted his payment for sin. And we have rebelled and chosen to be out rejecting the Lord with our life. And that's an amazing thing. Because even though we did that, even though that was our choice, rejecting his will for our lives, instead of rejecting us in return, he sent his son to die for our sins. And that is the Lord making us a priority. That's the Lord saying, I'm faithful to you, even when you're not faithful to me. And that's where all the difference is made in the world. Because it's that faithfulness of God that allows us to say, it doesn't matter what else has occurred. It doesn't matter what else goes on in my life. It doesn't matter what other company, what a company may feel about me. Because at the end of the day, the creator of everything, the Lord of the universe, he has said he loves me and he has accepted me while I was yet a sinner. So that when we turn to him, that's the difference. That's why it's still powerful to those who do not follow the Lord right now. But when they hear about his love for them, when they see God with his hand extended to them, that's why it's life changing. That's what makes all the difference in the world to somebody when they're lost and they're hurting and their hearts are broken. Because that's really what we've got out there is a society with a lot of people with broken hearts who have no idea the value that God sees in them. And when they learn of that value, when they learn what the Lord cares about them, that makes all the difference in the world. That changes absolutely everything. And so... Even though there were three men mentioned in this chapter are the unknowns, they were not the unfaithfuls. They each followed Christ, lived for Christ, and fulfilled his call in their lives. Their silence is golden for our eyes and for our hearts today. That's why I wanted to hold communion till the end. Because I can tell you right now, in this room people are feeling unknown silent, wondering if the Lord even hears 
knows where you are or what's going on in your life. He sees you. He knows exactly what's going on. He knows everything that's going on in your life. You're not insignificant to God. He loves you with an everlasting love. That's what communion does for us, is remind us of how much God loved us because we remember Christ's death. We remember that he went and paid the ultimate price for us willingly. He had not made a mistake. He had never sinned. He chose to go through the crucifixion for us so that you would be able to be back in right relationship with God. So that you would be able to walk and talk with the Lord God Almighty like Adam and Eve did before they fell in the garden. He made that choice. And he did it even when you weren't looking at him. He was looking at you even when you weren't looking at him. That's the most amazing thing that the Lord has done for any of us. That God Almighty looks down and says, I love you so much that even though you weren't looking at me, even though you had no concept of me, he loved you that much that Jesus went to the cross and paid that price so that you could step into the presence of the holy God. The ability to step behind that veil, something that the high priest had to go through so much effort for one time a year with a rope tied around his ankle just in case he messed up and the very presence of God killed him because of a holy God requiring no sin. It says when Jesus died on the cross, the veil in the temple was rent, which was, means it was torn from top to bottom because there was no longer a need to have the Holy of Holies separated that we could once again come into the very presence of the Almighty God. Ken and Suzanne, would you guys mind helping with communion today, please?